So, you are cordially invited then to come and uh, to come and see us uh, in uh, Bassano de Grappa uh, whenever you will have the chance to go further. We are on the opposite side of the northern part of Italy, we are on the eastern side of the Veneto region. So today the uh, idea is to tell you uh, my personal experience of being, uh, I joined the company as soon as I finished my military service, so I was five years young, and uh, I've been doing this for 30 years now, so I feel uh, uh, really a beginner, because after 30 years, uh, 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 I more question mark rather than answers. So the more I, go, I the more I proceed, the more I go ahead, uh, the more doubt I have in front of me. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you today is simply my experience so far, and uh, I hope it will be at least useful. The, uh, no, no. Okay. So, so I interrompo the wrong book. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so. And, and guys, also, if you want uh, to ask a question, uh, it's okay to raise your hand uh, and uh, just ask uh, because we don't have a program to follow, but uh, we are here just to speak with you. So don't worry if you have any question, any curiosity, just, just raise your hand. Feel free to interrupt and... Uh... Un'azienda è anche, anche l'espressione dei bisogni palesi o latenti, dei sentimenti, dei pensieri di un individuo o di un gruppo di individuo. Questa company is a, a way to express the needs uh, 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 the, the explicit need, the known needs or the unknown needs, unconscious or unconscious or conscious needs, needs, feelings, as well as the thought of a person or a group of persons. This is my personal point of view. Okay, this has not been written anywhere in any. <laughs> in any marketing uh, book. Uh, this, this is what I feel. I feel that uh, a company is a, is a way to talk, is a way to express yourself, is a way to uh, express uh, your ability, your skills, uh, uh, like painting, like singing, like uh, doing many other things. Okay? It's a way to talk, it's a way to express. The fact is that over the years, uh, the way of talking, the way of communicating has been changing dramatically. Uh, at my grandfather's times, a glance uh, was enough. Un'occhiata bastava. Ti guardava con un'occhiata e lui già aveva, aveva spiegato tutto. Uh, just by looking at you, it, he was communicating, he was already explaining what he, has in, he had in his mind. At my father's time, it was harder in the sense that uh, he needed to discuss in order to impose his point of view. We have to comunque litigare. Because to watch, to, to watch people was not enough anymore. And uh, me and my father, we had uh, many discussions, many discussions. We were constantly fighting, we were constantly in conflict because of, of our different opinions, our different way of thinking, of doing, of expressing our personality through our products. We have a more diverse di pensare. When I was a kid, and I grew up in a company, in a family, and we're family and company. I, I, I said company and family because to me, company and family 
at the end, uh, it's the same story. I mean, there is no real difference uh, in between personal life and professional life. Uh, my house, where I was, where I was born, where I grew up, uh, is inside the distillery. When I went out of my house, I was inside the distillery. So when I was a kid, I was playing with the, the panas, the skin of the grape, the vinacha. So for me, there is no there is no difference between personal life and professional life. Uh, there are no hobbies. Uh, my, my life is my, my activity, my, my job. And, and I grew up in a family, and I grew up in a company, where there was no communication. My grandfather didn't talk that, mu that much. He simply watched people. And my father tried to do the same, but he had to convince people by imposing his opinion. So I grew up in an in a ambience uh, where communication was not uh, really uh, the key factor. As a matter of fact, I used to think uh, when I would be adult, I want to talk without, I want to be understood without talking. That was my, my idea. Parlare, can farmi capire senza parlare. Somehow, uh, life brought me through a different path. And I turned into, and to admit, I am a person who can communicate. I have to communicate. There is no way to not communicate. You have to communicate. Uh, so it's a kind of paradox. Somehow, somehow the, the kind of activity that uh, I chose uh, was completely against what I was thinking when I was a child. I'm communicating more and more and more. And today I'm here to communicate, uh, which was not my goal when I was a kid. Let me give you an overview. And I'm, I'm saying this because uh, The fact that you are here, you are taking part in this course, you came from Lithuania, Slovakia, Mexico, for sure it's not from Italia, or wherever, it's not by chance. There, is some, there are some reasons why uh, you feel you need to be well prepared in the field of communication. And what I learned by experience is that uh, very often people follow certain ways because of their family history. Somehow our parents, our grandparents left us a kind of heritage of which we are consciously or unconsciously uh, <coughs> Uh, we are being a lot of the heritage of the legacy of uh, our family, of uh, our ancestors, uh, and uh, so on. So, so the, following a, a path. A path. So the, the key factor is to be conscious. Uh, so to act uh, not because you are unconsciously doing something because other people before in your family did the same, but take, take consciousness of, of your skills and your, um, your abilities. So let me give you an overview of, the, of this market, of the grappa market. The grappa market maybe is quite popular or well known or familiar to the Italians, maybe it's not that familiar for the other guys. But let me tell you that uh, grappa, is, uh, as I was saying, uh, before, the very beginning has always been the most important uh, spirit in Italy. Before 1933, uh, Grappa was sold uh, in uh, Bach, which means uh, a Venuta Scusa. So people could go out and buy a pack, not in, not in bottle. Not in you, bottle. Could, you just go to the tavern and you buy, and you buy one glass. Uh, Grappa, or you bring your bottle and ask uh, to the bartender, please uh, fill, fill, it fill it up uh, my bottle and so on. 
laptop without a label, without a brand name. When it was bottled, it simply bear the name Grappa, no producer name, no author content, no quantity. Of course, there were uh, other counterfection uh, products that were also illegally produced uh, and uh, somehow sold in the market. And that was the reason why, in 1933, a law was issued that compelled to uh, write the name of the producer, the alpha percent, and the, and the quantity. So, Grappa began to be labeled in a kind of modern way, indicating the producer, the kind of product, and so on. Uh, the word grappa could be also replaced by the word aquavite di vinaccia, which means uh, gray mark spirit, or pamas brandy. Uh, the vinaccia is the skin of the grape. In France, it is called uh, Mark. In English, it is Pamas, Fomachi. Aquavite means uh, water of life. Aquavite, divinaccia, is the spirit made out of the skin of the grape. Uh, so, grappa is an aquavite, but not all aquavite are grappa. Grappas because grappa is specifically the aquavite made still in the skin of the grape. But you can make aquavite from other kind of uh, raw material. In France, if you still wine, you make cognac. In Italian, it's aquavite divino, wine distilled. Or armagnac, the same. In Slovakia, what do you distill in Slovakia? Plants or uh, or uh, raspberries or uh, herbs. I don't know. Okay. So distilling plant, you make an aquavite di prune plant distillate, uh, which might take the name Nivovitz uh, or, yeah, exactly. or something like that. Uh, distilling pear, you get uh, William brandy or distilled apple di pere and so on and so forth. Whiskey is the name of the aquavite di cereali, so grain distillate made in Ireland, in Scotland, and so on. In the case of Grappa, we're talking about the aquavite di vinaccia. From, the vinaccia has to come from grape cultivated and distilled in Italy. Okay. So if you uh, distill the vinaccia, the mark, in France, that cannot be legally called Grappa, but we could will be called the Mark, uh, only the Mark, according to the Mark, in Francese. So the word Grappa nowadays uh, is a legal uh, definition, but the Acquavite di Vinaccia is still legal, okay? Okay, so typically a company used to produce uh, a, a classic, uh, let's say, according to the Vinaccia was made by distilling any kind of grape variety together. And that was the typical kind of grappa. It could be also aged in wood, and that was the Stravecchia, very old. It could be flavored with uh, an herb <coughs> known as a ruta. If the grape variety was particularly aromatic, in that case, uh, it was possible to have a grappa di moscato, for instance. Okay? So a grape variety that could give uh, a, a distinctive aroma. But typically, one company had one, two, three products at the most. The young grappa, the aged grappa, and the flavored grappa. La persona che vive chiata con la mazzata. That was it. So the, the, the portfolio of a distillery was very limited. Only one, two, three products at the most. Anything about the classical distinction 
of Graffa is uh, in new reading about Paul Museum. This distinction between uh, seasonal Graffa, Math Graffa, and so on is already new in this. And this was the situation till the 60s. In the 60s, Uh, a, band, um, a group of uh, companies decided to turn Grappa into a national spirit. Before, Grappa was a local spirit. There were something like 2,000 small arts and distilleries operating in, uh, in the local market distilling uh, the vinaccia, the skin coming from the local wineries uh, and selling their products uh, to the nearby customers. Okay. In the 60s, uh, five, six uh, big distilleries decided uh, to change the perception of Rafa, turning Rafa into a national product. For the Italian guys, these names uh, might be quite uh, popular. Piave, Bocchino, Tendolina, Giulia, Libarna, Fiorvite, okay? In the 60s, this company began to use modern marketing techniques. Uh, marketing was uh, uh, becoming fashionable, becoming popular in those days, uh, and these big companies began to use these techniques. Uh, by uh, mixing uh, the factors of price, product placement, uh, promotion. Was the product somehow different uh, on the Grappa in the 30s uh, and Grappa in the 60s? Very much so. Uh, for two main reasons. First of all, the technique of distillation. The small arts and distillers uh, before were using the so-called uh, discontinuous method or batch distillation, which means that the, the, the pumice and the skin are distilled in a pot, quindi sono distillate in una caldaia. The, the steam goes through the pumice and removes the part, which is then condensed and become dry. At the end of this cycle, the pumice has to be removed and a new cycle begins again. So that's the artisan way of making rubber. As you saw in the video, the video when uh, uh, they uh, keep uh, the skin of uh, the grape out of the big pot uh, after uh, the producing of uh, the you saw it uh, in the uh, movie. This, this large pot uh, to open it uh, and to take off uh, everything uh, and then to recharge uh, everyone every time. Uh, you start the process. So. Uh, I can show you very most famous. So this is a pot. Inside you have some uh, basket. In each basket you have some pumice. Uh, the steam goes through and go into a column that concentrates the alcoholic part and then you get the alcohol. Okay? This is a, a discontinuous distillation, which means a batch distillation. Because once you have distilled this pot, you have to replace the distilled plumas with the plumas. In the 60s, these group of distilleries began to use a new concept which is known as continuous. Distillation. In this case, uh, You have a big uh, kind of uh, machine uh, where the panels are continuously introduced. 
they go into this kind of uh, big machine. There's a hole on the other side, and the pumas are continuously removed. So they get continuously in and continuously out. And while they are moving, in this case, the pama says, uh, uh, not moving, the steam goes through. While in this case, the pama is moving, and the steam goes through the pama and on the other side, you get dark. What is the difference? Huge. In terms of cost and production per uh, per day, in a, in a discontinuous steel, you can get uh, you can distill uh, twenty tons per day with the batch distillation, while a continuous steel allows you to distill. 300 tons per day, so 15 times more per day. So what a normal distillery can distill in 15 days, uh, this guy could distill in one day. You can imagine how their grappa was much cheaper uh, and how they, the competition began, became very, very tough. As a matter of fact, of the 2,000 distilleries that were existing uh, before this new technology, only 89 survived. So more than 1,900 distilleries simply disappeared. The band of quality, there is a difference between uh, continuous and discontinuous, or the final product is the same? Uh, quite, a, quite, quite a distinct difference. Okay, let's say that they... The quality of uh, the artisan grappa, the grappa made with the discontinuous cycle, varies depending on uh, the quality of the raw material, and the skill of the distiller. So if you have a quality raw material and you know how to deal with it, you can make an excellent cup. If the raw material is uh, not well, uh, um, it's not good uh, and you're not taking care properly, you can have uh, a terrible cup. The industrial cup is always the same. So you can never, you never, you will never get the peak of quality, nor peak, nor disaster. Okay, you, you will have a standard, neutral, anonymous grappa. No bad, no, no good. The artisan grappa can be excellent, or sometimes can be disgusting. That depends on the raw material and uh, on the ability of the institute. Okay. So only 89 distilleries survived. On the other side, the industrial guide were 34. So not many, but because of their bigger capacity of production, today 82% of the grappa comes from this guy, and only 18 come from this guy. Okay? So the majority of the grappa today produced in Italy is made with the continuous industrial uh, process of distillation. So everything began in the 60s. Excuse me. What kind of technology do you use now? We are, uh, my family has always and only used the batch distillation. We had, we had no money in the 60s to uh, upgrade our 
our technique. So we were stuck with that uh, old-fashioned kind of uh, steel, kind of lambic. That was our major point of weakness. We could not compete. Uh, we were in a very tough situation. But today, <clears throat> you had the resources uh, theoretically to jump in the continuous uh, steel. Uh, <laughs> now it's not just uh, a constraint, a budget constraint. Now it's a choice. Uh, or that, that is a good question. Uh, five years ago, in 2005 precisely, we began a project of uh, a new building next to the distillery. And our first idea was to install an industrial continuous steel. Because we, we, we have a good demand, uh, the demand of the market is uh, quite, quite good, uh, and the, our production capacity is, uh, is uh, always... Uh, so we just say you cannot in increase uh, the, quantity of, the quantity of grapple you are producing uh, is determined by the number of pot you have. Uh, How many pot do you have? Before? Twelve. Uh, so we were thinking, we were seriously thinking for three, four years uh, to install a, a, a continuous steel. And then we said, no, that is not our way, that is not our uh, philosophy. So we changed our mind and uh, we are now not because of budget constraints, but because of our choice, so we are still so back in the 60s, uh, it was uh, it's something of uh, the only way possible to the company. Yeah. And now it's a sort of value to so yeah. remain uh, on uh, value. That, that is the fact. To be able to turn a weakness into a strength. That's the value. Uh, I'll... Uh, We'll go back into this point later. Let me first uh, We are in the 80s. You can recognize we are in the 80s. So when I joined the, when I joined the company, uh, the distillery was facing a very tough situation because uh, as many other distilleries, we were almost out of business. And it said that more than 1,800 distilleries disappeared. And we were also in that uh, very tough financial condition, situation. We had no money, a uh, lot of debt. So the situation was really desperate, and that was uh, the welcome in the company that we, my sister, my brother, we had when we finished our, our studies and we finished our military service, uh, we joined the company, and the company was literally collapsing. The walls, the roof was, was, coming, was coming down. It was really tough. And at that point, I use uh, uh, I'm an accountant. Okay. Uh, I had no money to uh, go to the university. That is my uh, biggest uh, regret. Uh, there was no, no way, no chance. But I studied the situation and I evaluated the point of default of the strength family of our distillery. And first of all, I have to say that we had, uh, I saw we had a nice, uh, strong uh, family tradition, which I thought was uh, a value. So we were in the 80s, uh, beginning of the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s. Uh, the continuous distilling uh, method was uh, rampaging, uh, so everything in the market, uh, almost everything in the market was caught by 
the industrial distilleries. Poly distillery were in a very hard time, problem of uh, economic stability, problem of also of image of the grappa and so on. Jacopo finished the military service and coming back to the distillery started to begin to think how to survive. Uh, how to survive. 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 Uh, so another strength point uh, was uh, the kind of culture my family had, had uh, which was a uh, mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. Humanistic culture. Humanistic. 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 Humanity studies. Humanity studies. Uh, uh, my, uh, studies. Uh, my father, my grandfather, they always uh, uh, loved the Greek uh, uh, lecture literature. So that kind of studies. Uh, not technical not technical studies, but uh, more literature, history, poetry. So, uh, these pictures are uh, back uh, in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. They so, are for the 30s in the so, 19th century. Can you, can you see this teacher? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Does it give you an idea of how was the sign of the teacher in those days? So, uh, and this is, a, this is my aunt and this is my uncle. Uh, so that was the kind of uh, culture we had in our house, and I think it was uh, that was a nice uh, background. A nice background. My father also studied uh, as a teacher, and uh, he was uh, in Tebogara. He was uh, here. He asked me a question about after school. I had to go uh, to him. And he was questioning me about uh, what, I, what I was studying. The fact is that he didn't care what I was studying, what I was uh, learning at school. He was questioning me about what he learned when he was at school. Okay? Così mi chiedeva dei dei classici greci, dei classici latini, e io ovviamente non sapevo nulla. Era abbastanza imbarazzante. He asked about stuff. He studied school a long time ago, not what uh, was uh, actually in uh, the lesson uh, of the for, for the child at that time. Uh, so very difficult question. Another another uh, strength point was the the quality we could get out of this uh, pot steel. So this was the pot steel that my uh, great grandfather installed in those days. Uh, so a pot steel is the one that I draw, composed of three pots, one column, condenser, uh, measuring, alpha machine, and a receiver. So the quality was good. But what were the weakness points? First of all, it was an, a very expensive uh, way of distilling, uh, and very, and the quantity uh, per day was very limited. Uh, so we were out of business in terms of uh, possibility to compete with other industrial distilleries because this is a labor-intensive process uh, which requires a lot of workers. This was not a problem uh, in the old days. Uh, at my grandfather's time, there were plenty of workers, uh, mostly farmers, that during winter time had nothing to do in the fields, and they were happy to come to the distillery in a warm ambience <coughs> to take care of the distillation. But could I explain it to, to, to sorry, please, just please, please, please. Uh, his, his grandfather, Giovanni Poli was uh, the man who uh, transformed uh, the distillery from uh, an, a very uh, artisan level to a first step uh, of industry. And uh, 
the, the pot you saw, the stiller you saw in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, picture, was started to do in the beginning of the 30s, uh, when Grappa was uh, still, uh, well, well, when uh, they start to sell Grappa in bottle with a, with a, a very specific uh, brand mark uh, for uh, the Grappa, and they start to increase production and so on. So this was the first step uh, of industrialization and uh, Giovanni Poli was a sort of uh, a commercial genius uh, at the time because he took a businessman. Yeah, he took a very small distillery and uh, bring it uh, to be one important uh, distillery in the province. Uh, obviously, we are in a period where Grappa was not yet industry, was uh, was stealing at an artisan, a big artisanal level, but was one of the most important uh, distillery in the area of Vicenza. But the model uh, which Giovanni Poli used uh, was very good for the 1930s, uh, but was not possible to uh, replicate uh, its model, uh, the, his model, uh, after the Second World War. Uh, because before the war, uh, Italy was a poor country without any possibility of uh, industrialization and so on. Uh, Schiavon, where the distillery is uh, in a uh, rural area, uh, agriculture was still uh, very poor, uh, so it was very easy if you were in the countryside to, uh, to take uh, people to work for you during the winter season and so on. And this was the model of Giovanni Poli, very successful, but impossible to replicate in the 50s when uh, labor starts to be more expensive and when the competition of the industrial producer starts to, uh, to lower and lower the price of grappa. So this was the situation. And this was why one model was successful in the service and was not in uh, was not more successful in the 50s and in the 60s. Exactly. So, uh, this was a problem. Another problem was the lack of distribution. So, we, the, the quality was good, the price was not competitive, but the main problem was that there was no distribution. This means that the customers had to come to the distillery uh, to buy their products, uh, we sometimes use the, uh, to deliver, but there was no network of distribution, which are not related to the design. Nor we used to work with uh, any supermarket in those days. They were early and um, began to exist in the 50s and 60s. Uh, no restaurants, no bars. So it was just a micro local distribution. That was a serious. Mm -hmm. So just the local area and the road. Yeah. That was typical for all these uh, small distilleries. As you can imagine, 2,000 distilleries, many, and most of them were in the northern part <coughs> of uh, Italy, uh, means a big competition. <coughs> In our province, in the province of Vicenza, there were 50 distilleries. 50 distilleries. So there was a kind of mutual agreement that every distillery was working just uh, nearby his, uh, uh, his uh, area. So nobody was going to sell his grandpa in the area of another distillery, and the other distillery were not coming from our area. Okay. So this means that we were selling our product uh, in a range of, uh, let's say, 25 kilometers along the road. Uh, so it was a very small area of distribution. As you can easily imagine, there was no way to survive. And another weakness point was the lack of leadership. When my grandfather passed away, uh, he had four... Uh, sons, two boys and two girls. Uh, the two girls got married, uh, and uh, typically, when uh, a woman was married, uh, he had to leave the company. So the two boys he married the company, but none of them had the same charisma of my grandfather. 
So they had a different temperament. My uncle was more an administrator. My father was more a technician. Uh, so none of, none of them was able to, to really lead the company. And this was another big problem because the company had not a, an identity. It used to have a very precise identity when there was my grandfather. As I said before at the very beginning, a company is also a way to express yourself. And my grandfather had a big personality. And he was able to express his personality through his activity. My father, my aunt, had also a kind of personality, but none of them felt they could, they were allowed to express themselves through the company because none of them was a leader. And none of them accepted the, the other to be leader. Some example uh, about uh, how John Pauli express uh, himself uh, to the products uh, to the Giovanni was my grandfather. But first of all, let's say that um, he was really a, a, an enlightened uh, businessman, an normal illuminato for the And enlightened businessman. So he had the first tracking down, the truck I showed you before. Okay, this was the, the first uh, truck in town. Uh, with, with a, um, advertising, okay. So for those days uh, it was, uh, and then he was also the first to have a private telephone. The telephone number of the distillery in those days was simply number two, okay. And number one was the telephone number of the telephone company. This means that for a certain period of time, the distillery and the, tel and the telephone operator they had to speak each other together because there was nobody else to speak with. And it was thanks to this telephone con connection that my father, he, met the daughter of the telephone operator. Praticamente c'era le linee telefoniche che avevano appena cominciato ad ampliarsi. La distribuzione era il numero due, la compagnia telefonica che si chiamava Telve. Helve was the name of the telephone company, Telefonia Venezia. Uh, and then I had number one. E quindi si sono conosciuti mio padre, ha conosciuto mia mamma, perché lei era la figlia del centralinista. My mother was the daughter of the telephone operator. So my, my grandfather was a, a man of, uh, he was an innovative person. But at the same time, he had also very high moral principles. The principi morali non ferri. He used to say in Italiano, vendicaro, ma pesa giusto. Which means, uh, so expensive, you can sell so expensive, but wait for the right uh, weight. Sell so expensive, but at the right weight. Uh, not the uh, right shit. Uh, on the way to sell a cheaper exactly. So know? be be fair, be be honest, be, be honest. And this way of making business in a very honest way is still the way that we're doing what we do today. Anyway, so it's expensive, but not what are you buying? Yeah. Quindi, uh, punto di forza, debolezza, le minacce, prezzi, the the minaccia seria era chiudere l'azienda. So the, we were very, very close to die. We were very close to, to give up, to, to go out of business. After the death of Giovanni Poli, the grandfather. But there was an opportunity. There was an opportunity. The opportunity was to develop a, a business model <coughs> based on a very simple concept of we described as artigianato corto. Artigianato corto learned craftsmanship. Learned craftsmanship. Craftsmanship, but not just to make it up in the stable, but people who studied somehow and who consciously follow the idea of craftsmanship. See, 
uh, almost a knowledgeable uh, craftsmanship, uh, something like that. Okay, come to the for example, for example. Yes. Okay. Okay. Le, 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 Now it will be a do it in a traditional way, but with caution. Knowing what you're doing. Uh, Problematizando l'ovvio. Please translate. Eh. Ok. Comunque, l'idea è quella di take, uh, taking to ask yourself questions, also in topic with you always considered as obvious. No. So not to take anything for, not, don't take anything for granted. So no non don't take anything for granted. So this idea is that uh, if you take a step in a direction, si basava su tre valori. Was based on three main values. The family. Our family has very deep uh, root, root in our land. This is my family tree. And the second guy. My father's name was, was Antonio. He was son of Giovanni, son of Giovanni. Son of Giovanni, son of Giovanni, son of Giovanni, son of Giovanni, uh, son of Marco, Giovanni, Antonio, Battista, Antonio, Polo, Pietro, Castro. So very deep root in this, uh, in this uh, land. Uh, and that has a meaning. That has a meaning. That has a value. So we felt uh, we, had, we had to search the values that were into this family history. And the values are the sense of beauty, the sense of responsibility, the, the pleasure of uh, producing a, a nice, well-made product. That is the, the, that's the, that's the pleasure. The pleasure of seeing a, a, custom, a satisfied customer. Il piacere di vedere un cliente soddisfatto, il piacere di fare un buon prodotto, bello e ben fatto. Uh, il senso della responsabilità, il senso del dovere, l'orgoglio di portare avanti una, una tradizione. To be, to be proud of the tradition, to be proud to make something well and to satisfy the customer so the good product. So the family carries on certain values <coughs> and the family is a value on its own. Quindi la famiglia è di per sé un valore che a sua volta porta avanti dei valori. Okay. Uh, by the way, the name of the family Poli comes from the name of this guy, Pollo. Paul was living in the 14th century in the nearby where we are area, the, the hills and mountains. So at the end of Middle Ages, in the beginning of the early modern age, how did you know all the stuff? Uh, that was a research that was carried on by Professore di Storia Medievale Bassano. Medieval Historian in Bassano. He carried on the research about the family trees and uh, he discovered that a huge quantity of information that we didn't know 10 years ago and that opened the, uh, the curtain over our past, giving us uh, so many information that were useful 
to better understand the present. Okay? By the way, his name, Paolo, Paolo, was chosen because he was quite rich for those days. Uh, where he was living, he had uh, four pieces of land, uh, 40 sheep and three cows. Aveva quattro pezzi di terra, quattro campi di terra, 40 pecore e tre vacche. Ed è questo il motivo per cui il suo nome è diventato il cognome della famiglia. So his, his name became the family, the family name. Oli, in Latin, simply means son of Paul. If we were born in Spain, because it was quite rich uh, then, uh, so every, uh, every people related to him was called uh, like him, uh, son of Paul. Exactly. Uh, another value is the l'artigianalità e uh, the handcraft, craftsmanship, uh, hand, hand craftsmanship, which in my opinion is a value because uh, say if, if there is a chance we can survive the globalization is only if we put uh, in our products uh, a quality manufacturing equality which came uh, from uh, uh, the work you made with your hand. Un quality manufacturing. The grappa has the possibility. Non è it's not easy to translate the quality manufacturing. <laughs> Let's say the, the it's not just manufacturing quality. It, it, it is something more in Italian. It's not just uh, well done. It's well done with your hand. Okay. And so there is no, no other way to, to fight against um, uh, China or uh, other countries if not by giving this extra value of uh, artisanalità but not the artigianalità of the old days. Artigianalità colta, quindi una artigianalità uh, condita di mente e cuore. It's not just to do things uh, as, well, as well as they were a donna in, uh, in old times, but uh, it's to complete uh, the tradition uh, with learning, uh, with understanding, uh, from study and uh, so on. How are you? Is my English uh, understandable? Yes. Uh, yes. If you have a question, ask don't move it. Am I boring you? No. No, no I'm uh, I'm more boring you. The third value is the culture. The culture. Uh, because, uh, and that's the reason why we founded the Grappa Museum in 1993, and the second museum in 2011. In both cases, uh, what we are trying to do is to explain what there is behind the public Grappa. So what we're trying to do is to let people feel the culture, the, culture, the history, uh, the values that are hidden in the public Grappa. Quindi, the three values are family, artisan, artisan care, artisanality, artisan care, and, uh, and culture, which are the strength that we evaluated uh, in the 80s. So, in those days, uh, the fact of being an artisan company was a weak point, but we have been able to turn it uh, into a strength point uh, because of the quality that we were able to provide. So we worked hard uh, in following certain uh, goals. First of all, to become very knowledgeable. When I joined the company, I was 20 years old. I had no credibility. Uh, I was younger. I had uh, no charisma, 
So the only choice was to be very knowledgeable. So I learned, I studied, that, I traveled, that, I visited many distilleries, I went anywhere, uh, I met a lot of people. I needed to be technically impeccable. Do I select the king coming that perfect? Because I could not count on experience. I could not go to a customer and say, hey, I'm the one, I'm the man. But I had to be precise and well prepared. Any question, I had to know the answer. It's a sort of, <clears throat> it's a sort of paradox. A long tradition, but no experience. Wow. So, 100 years of tradition, because the distillery was founded in 1898, but no, 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 personal, no personal experience. With tradition, no experience. My father, my uncle, they didn't go out to present the company because they, none of them uh, ever did it. So I was the one. But I was young, uh, so that's why I had to be very knowledgeable. I studied, I sti I'm still studying. I went through to any kind of course, any kind of lesson. Wherever I can learn, I still go with always an open mind. And always with the approach of a beginner. I don't take anything for granted. The second goal is to become very, very indagatore. Indagatore means very curious. Try to feel what the customer is looking for. Try to understand what the, the market is needing. So is the kind of grata that we were producing in those days still good for the modern demand? Is our proposal still suitable for the contemporary taste? Or do we need to adjust our production to the need of the modern customers? The third goal was to, to be very good. Grappa had to become better. The quality grappa was uh, not good enough for foreigners, for people that were not used to drink the old fashioned grappa. So we needed that to make uh, to improve our quality by selecting uh, fresh plants, distilling with care, in order to make uh, a pleasant spirit. Quindi produrre un distillato che desse piacere. The fourth goal was to become nice. Because the product can be good, but then it has to be well presented, it has to be well packaged. So the care in packaging, the care in the labeling, the care in the, uh, in the way the product uh, shows itself in the market uh, is very important. So we are still paying attention to this aspect uh, because uh, a good product uh, deserves a good packaging. They have to be in relation. Packaging has not to be more important than the, than the product itself. But they have to be in balance. Another goal was to be very well distributed because you can make a good product, you can package, you can make a nice packaging, but if you don't go out and sell it, you don't survive. So we started searching for new customers, new importers. I went to fairs, uh, exhibitions. Uh, I traveled uh, everywhere in the world, and nowadays we are exporting uh, our products in uh, more than 56, uh, 57 countries. Uh, some of them are key countries, some of them are small countries, but very important uh, because when you sell that in Sri Lanka or in Guatemala or in uh, Malaysia or in India, India very difficult, so it, it, it's nice. Uh, uh, it's nice to see that uh, Grandpa was able to go over 
the Italian ghetto. Diventare molto affidabile, which means uh, to become uh, reliable, because the people trust uh, a company because of its uh, heritage, because of its uh, consistency, because of the quality that has been able to provide over the years. Uh, so people uh, do not choose a graph upon the great, the great variety, upon the region where the graph came from. They mostly trust a brand. So to become reliable has a lot to do with the brand building. So you, over the years, uh, proving that uh, you behave in a serious, correct, honest, and consistent way, you build up a kind of consistency. And these, uh, hopefully, will help to become more known in the majority of the brand. Uh, I don't know if we achieved this goal yet. Uh, I'm doing this only over the last 30 years, and I was saying at the very beginning, I still feel uh, as a beginner. So I see in front of me a long, long way uh, in order to achieve this uh, uh, goal, to, to become well known. And, uh, and finally, we have to start from the very beginning again, because uh, if you are paying attention to the quality, the packaging, the distribution, the reliability, uh, and the notoriety, then you will see that uh, you need to start again from the very beginning and learning and uh, and at the same time delegating to other people some roles uh, so you can do something else. So we finally developed the this way to communicate our company, based on these six elements that together create the complexity of travel. Geography, roots, actuality, production, product, and affinity. So we are using the word graph to convey these six elements. Geography, which means that we are located in quite a unique Place Bassano Grappa, which is considered the heart of grappa production in Italy. It's a nice area, so we also are trying to convey the values of this land. We have a long history, starting from my great grandfather, my grandfather. My father and his brothers. So the value of the family, as I was saying before. In the same time, we are trying to produce a grappa that uh, suits the modern contemporary taste. So a grappa that is pleasant, well made. We are still uh, using uh, an artisan way of. Uh, Still, so we are still uh, making rap like in the old days, but with an open, modern uh, mind. We produce a range of products that uh, uh, is uh, more diversified compared to the rap that was made in the old days, uh, with the final goal to please the customer, to create an affinity, a relation with the customers. Every customer has different uh, taste, every grappa too. So our goal is to let them meet together. Okay? So this is what we have been doing over the last uh, 30 years. Uh, some of them are in Italian, some of them are in English. So you can choose. Uh, yes, we have the one inside of here. So uh, they were very, very lucky because 
This, uh, uh, this model to present the more graph of words uh, in Italian, in English, and in German, too. <laughs> so, in, ge in Japanese, we <laughs> think it's a little bit but we manage to use the words in Russian. 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 Just as... Okay. I have a question. I read from the side that there is a museum, uh, and I, I want to know in which way you promote the museum and the, also the, your, your brand with the museum. Okay, the museum was founded in 1993 in the city center of Bassano de Grappa because uh, I felt that uh, any, any spirit in the world, uh, cognac, whiskey, armagnac, are well supported by museum, both public or private museums, uh, that conveys the, uh, the history of these distillates. And in the case of Rapa, there was nothing. So I felt that it was the case to, to pay a tribute to Grappa, and that's the reason why we, we opened this museum. The name is Poly Grappa Museum. Poly Museo della Grappa is not the museum of the Poly Grappa. Mm -hmm. It's the Poly Grappa Museum, which means yeah. that the, the Poly family promotes Grappa as a whole. As, a, as the, the, the whole graph market, we are not promoting our graph there. The museum is uh, uh, an independent company. It doesn't belong to the distillery. Uh, it's not uh, a non-profit organization. But uh, nobody gets money out of the museum, which means that the museum, si uh, sostiene, Support, it, support, support, support itself by selling the product of the, of the distillery. So the museum buys the product from the distillery, sells them, and gets the money to survive and to make uh, his uh, activity. Uh, but but it's, it's, it's nobody has a position of Making profit for the museum. The museum, uh, the museum is making profit uh, selling a grappa. Uh, but uh, all the profit will remain to the museum to uh, furnishing or to cultural activities or to final special visits. And they, they have a lot of uh, people working in the museum, in the, in the two museums, because one is in Bassano, the city, and the other one is near the distillery. And uh, visits and uh, museums uh, are the key point of communication for Poly. Because Poly is not spending an euro in advertising, in television, in a magazine, and so on. That is true. We welcome, in Bassano, we welcome on average uh, between 8,000 to 10,000 people per month. So there's a good amount of people visiting the, the museum in Bassano. There we have a counter that allows us to see precisely how many people are getting inside and getting outside. In this, in this Kevon, the new museum was founded in 2011 because of the need of a bigger space, also for groups uh, coming with uh, a big bus. Uh, there, it's not easy to count the people because uh, there are many accesses and many entrances. Uh, but in both cases, we do a lot of communication through these new two, two museums. One activity that we are going to do uh, in a month or so is publishing a book uh, where we will display all the graphs that we have been able to find in the market that were produced between the 30s and the 60s. Remember that period of time? Since when Grappa was labeled by law, by law, till when Grappa became an industrial product, okay? In the over 30 years, uh, and we were able to gather 371 bottles uh, belonging to 181 uh, distilleries, uh, of which uh, only 59 are still uh, uh, in business, okay? So we will publish this book uh, in uh, a month or so, and this book uh, will tell <coughs> will, will show the graph of the origins, the graph at the very beginning. So, 
So that would be, I think, something <coughs> quite unique that nobody has ever done so far. Other questions? How we can recognize grappa poly from the other just in the glass? Because we told you that you work to make grappa good but also beautiful. Why I can recognize immediately grappa poly? There are some uh, visual aspects that uh, makes our campus recognizable. Uh, first of all, the use of brand poly in a consistent way, the use of certain colors, uh, the use of certain uh, fonts. So this, these three colors, the cream, the gray, and the bordeaux, or Bordeaux, purple, red. These three colors have a meaning to us. Somehow they reflect the brain, the heart, the spirit. The way the, the brand is uh, displayed in all our pamphlets and all our bottles uh, is very consistent. And over the years, uh, the brand identity uh, has been built over these uh, elements. Furthermore, the kind of uh, packaging, in terms of the kind of closure. We choose the 25 years ago uh, kind of mechanic clip lock, double mechanic of okay. which became part of our style. So, in terms of uh, so the, the logo, the colors, the shape of the, of the label uh, is always very consistent. Uh, we adapted the um, concept of imagine coordinata. A coordinate major idea. Concept of coordinate major. So, so every, everything, everything has to be well. Consistent. Consistent and coordinated. And then this, this kind of closure um, makes us uh, unique uh, because this is the only company that adapted the, this proportion. This is not a new way of, this is very old. I, I was a kid. But the way of uh, this size, this proportion, the size of this uh, neck. And the proportion with the body of the bottle makes uh, quite a unique uh, composition. Uh, in Italy, traditionally, we use this kind of closure for uh, soft drinks, uh, for uh, soda mm -hmm. in the old times. Uh, so it's beer, not beer, as beer well. as well. But normally it's bigger. Well, we adapted a smaller uh, closure in a normal size bottle. And uh, which is in, on your couch? That's a good question. In the sense of the program? No, no, no. In the sense of the program. Ah, oh. <laughs> okay. We, we have a tattoo. Okay. Now, the, this is the, the logo of the, and also the, this is the logo of the, of the company. This was designed by uh, a teacher of uh, design uh, in the nearby city of uh, Nove, near the distillery. There is a place called Nove. It's quite famous for the ceramic industry. Also, uh, I think the Italian guys probably they've heard about the ceramic di Bassano, ceramic di Nove. Okay. So this this uh, designer designed this logo, which represents a kid who is carrying a basket of uh, uh, of pans, of So he's doing a heavy job, but he does it by smiling. So so read the thing he found 
quindi è un modo di esprimere l'idea che si può fare qualcosa di impegnativo ma se lo fai volentieri non pesa anzi ti porti da anche un piacere this means that you can do something that uh, requires a sacrifice that is happy somehow but if you do it because you like it uh, it's not a weight, it's a pleasure 